All right, welcome to Food Cost, the Beginner's Formula. I think most people understand or grasp the concept of food cost, right? What does my food cost relative to my sales? Most people ask this question so they can figure out what their leftover profitability is. But before we take this big jump forward and really dissect food cost, this is more of a course than it is a class. So today, I want to be surgical about the introduction to this conversation. And that's going to start by taking a step backwards before we can take a step forwards. So first we're going to explain the importance of food cost and why it's critical and how it has generated so much buzz over the years and over its lifespan throughout the industry. We're also going to take a really simplified look at food cost in general. We're going to discuss some common misconceptions and create some definition around terms and different phrases that you might have heard that probably require some clarity. And then we're going to look at the nine critical impacts that affect food cost. And finally, as a takeaway, I want everybody in the room to walk away with an opportunity to actually go out and start impacting those nine critical areas of the food cost today. So even if you're not an expert, even if you're just getting started in food cost and diving into this aspect of your business, I want you to at least have this gift of some best practice and some next practice in managing and controlling costs and profitability. So let's begin. I think the first and most critical thing to understand is why food cost is so critical to the conversation of restauranting. The sales dynamic of every dollar that comes into a restaurant is pretty universal industry-wide. In fact, there are uh, biannual reports that come out from a company called Deloitte. Uh, they're an accounting firm and consulting firm and they get together with the National Restaurant Association and they pull hundreds if not thousands of concepts over a two-year course. They look at their profit and loss statement and they aggregate this data to look at what is the average throughout the industry in food cost, labor cost, fixed expense, our non-fixed expense, and profitability. So what I've put up here is an opportunity to actually look at how this dollar is broken down. So you'll see first, 60 cents on every dollar is devoted to prime cost. So as soon as that dollar goes into the till, 60 cents of it's already accounted for, period. Now, when we dig a little bit deeper, we can also see that from that remaining 40 cents on the dollar that's left over in total gross profit, that is also slowly chewed up and consumed. 20% of that goes to what's called our controllable expenses. And we can go into detail on that uh, a little bit later. Next, 10% goes into what's called our fixed cost. So controllable expenses, really quick, those are the things that you have to spend money on, but you don't necessarily have to spend as much money on depending on what your cash flow situation and things like that look like. Marketing, for example, everybody should be marketing and there's a critical reason why the industry spends 2% of sales on average on marketing. But given the different complexities of your business, cash flow, seasonality, those types of things can be curtailed. As opposed to the fixed costs, those fixed expenses actually aren't as negotiable. Rent, for example, is one of the items in a fixed cost. That's not going to change, at least it's not going to be changed or impacted by you month to month. So that is on this fixed line as opposed to the static line of controllable expense. Now, when you add up that 60 cents on the dollar in prime cost, 20 on the controllable expenses and another 11% on fixed expenses. That leaves the average operator in the industry with about nine cents left to take to the bottom line. What's interesting is if we break those numbers down a little further, what we tend to see is that these national and big chain restaurant groups are doing profitability in the range of 10 to 12% on average. And trust me, there's many doing well beyond that in the 20s. But on an average, 10 to 12% in profitability. When you look at the average independent restaurant, single or multi-unit independent smaller operator, 
the average contribution to the bottom or gross profit is four to five percent. So this gets us asking, why are these big corporate concepts or these big multi-unit concepts able to capture twice as much profitability as the independent? Well, believe it or not, we don't think that it has anything to do with how well they purchase or how well they sell. It really is relative, right? People are trying to hit the same type of static food cost line. People are trying to hit the same type of labor relative to rules. They're not incorporating overtime. They're managing their budgets. All of these things, if everybody did them the same, sales and the way people purchase their product doesn't necessarily impact this piece. It's the discipline around the profit and loss schedule and the one variable that often has the largest gap when it comes to profitability is food cost. So as we break down this dollar, and let's be specific, this is food and beverage cost. And that's a great place to start with some clarity around one of the first definitions I'd like to introduce you to. And that is the difference between food cost and cost of goods. Total cost of goods is indeed one big high-level bucket that we can look at compared to our sales. The reason why we don't just look at cost of goods is because it doesn't give us enough information in general. So let's talk a little bit about cost of goods. In the cost of goods, that is both your food and your non-food items. Food we can control, we can measure, and we can manage. The non-food items are a little harder to control and manage. They can still be managed, but not as granular and not as measurably as we can do with food. So let's talk about some non-food items. Think about your to-go containers. That's a great example of an item that we can't necessarily build into the recipe cost of a product because we don't know if every single customer that came in had their food to go, or if they ate it here, or if they ate it here and then took some to go. There's all kinds of category items that fall under non-food. We put that in a separate bucket, and we focus on food cost because this is what we can impact, measure, contain, control, and manage. So because of that, we really have to focus on food over everything else because it's typically the biggest culprit relative to what is robbing our profitability. And the big concepts know this. Another interesting statistic that comes from the NRA and Deloitte is that on average, restaurants that are using some type of inventory and food cost, food and beverage cost control system, typically have an 8.5% reduction in food cost over those who don't. So immediately, if we're looking at trying to figure out why these big national brands and big multi-unit concepts are twice or more profitable than the average independent, we could probably look here immediately. Now certainly, there's nothing more dynamic in this industry and possibly nothing more dynamic in any other industry than food cost. Labor is not simple by any means, but it is certainly easy compared to the complexity of food cost. We can look and manage our labor by controlling the times that we bring people in, making sure that people don't hit overtime, making our shift cuts when we see the volume start to tail off, making adjustments for the future weeks based on what our trend is doing, either up or down. So labor can be relatively controlled. But food cost is so dynamic because it hits us in three different capacities. And I can't think of another industry as dynamic as the restaurant industry when it comes to managing the overall cost of goods, and specifically food and beverage cost. And here's why. Very rarely will you find an industry that is a retail vehicle, a wholesale vehicle, and a manufacturing vehicle. So let's talk about retail real quick. We bring product in in bulk, we separate it, and we sell it individually. That would be something like your french fries. Wholesale, we bring product in in bulk, and we sell it in bulk. That might be something like big caterings, or large deli trays, or big huge continental breakfasts. Those things are a wholesale capacity. And then finally, we have manufacturing, and this is what is really, really challenging. Some of that product we bring in 
We take it right out of the box, put it in the fryer, boom, our French fries are out, easy to manage and control. But some of the product we bring in, and we've got to take multiple different products, blend them together, cook them, use different techniques, start with a beginning weight, render it, cook it down, figure out what our yield is, figure out how much all of those ingredients combined cost us to come up with this yield and then divide that by how we're going to serve it, either by the ounce or by the each or what have you. That's manufacturing. Take all of that and then do what no other industry has to face. And that is dealing with immense perishability, time, temperature, controls relative to portion and quality and quantity. There is nothing more dynamic in any other industry that I look at across the chasm of big business where I see something more complex and more convoluted. And because of all of that, because that is so multifaceted and so dynamic, if we don't pay attention to these items and look at them at a very, very granular level, we will not be able to control our costs and impact our profitability. So holy cow, that is really kind of the food cost introduction 102 or next level type of stuff. But just consider a broad stroke of what's in store and let's move into what we can control, what we can understand, and what we can manage when it comes to food cost. So the next definition I want to talk about before we move along to the key items that impact food cost is this concept of what we call actual cost versus ideal cost or theoretical cost. And it works like this. Theoretical cost is my recipe, the amount of portions that go in to build this plate, and how much each one of those portions cost. I can come up with a plate cost for everything. Now, if I executed that perfectly against the total number of sales that I had on that item and every other item, our cost should come out to be X, whatever that multiplier is of all of the product that we sold versus all the product that we bought and how much should have been used to make and execute those recipes. That's theoretical or ideal cost. Now the difference is when we actually count our inventory at the end of the month and we subtract what we had in the beginning from what we had in the end and we add that to our total purchases and then we divide that number by our sales, we're going to get what our actual food cost is. What's interesting is on average the gap in most restaurants between what their food cost should have been and what it actually was is about 9 to 10 percent. And that is what leads us into focusing on the 10, the nine, excuse me, the nine most critical culprits in this area and how we can start impacting them. So if we look at those nine things, I'm just going to run through the list and then we're going to break them down into a little bit of detail. And within each detail, I'm also going to give everybody this opportunity for a takeaway, for a thing that they can implement back when they get to work in the kitchen or with their staff so that they can start impacting these areas of cost right away. But for the sake of this top nine list, let's just run through them. First is waste. Second is theft. Third, we have spoilage. Then we have the biggest culprit of all, portion control. After that, we have menu engineering and another term that overlaps menu engineering that is called value proposition. Next, we have the lack or minimal cross utilization, recovery, which is an issue of sorts, and finally, yield. So those are the nine things. So let's break them down and talk about them a little bit more specifically. Let's start with waste, okay? Waste is the stuff that should have been used, but that didn't get used. And that can be for any number of reasons, right? We could drop something on the floor, we could burn it. There's a whole handful of different reasons where we could have waste. Sometimes that is employee meals that aren't being rang up. It can live in a lot of different ways. Certainly, it overlaps yield, right? Because there is waste when we prep product, when we're prepping onions, we're cutting off, you know, 10% off the top and the bottom, we're peeling one outer wrapper 
of the skin, and then we have our usable product. Well, that product is wasted, and even if we can reutilize it, we're probably not utilizing it to its fullest return potential. So within waste, one of the greatest tricks that I have ever learned in this industry was the concept of a trash audit. Now, a trash audit is fascinating, and we used to start them just by, we, we did them basically to kind of get some guest feedback on our product. So what we do, it certainly wasn't glorious, but it was very, very interesting, is we had garbage cans over by our dishwashing machines. Our servers would come, they'd scrape the plates, throw the silverware in the blue bucket, hand the dish off to the dishwasher. At the end of a shift, on a busy shift, we, when we had time, we would take this garbage can out to the back and myself and a couple of our culinary guys would dump this garbage can out on a big blue tarp in the alley. And we'd have our gloves and our aprons and our goggles on and we would kind of take a stick or maybe at sometimes our hands and we'd kind of sift through this garbage to see what's the reoccurring theme here. And I'll give you a great example. One thing that we noticed the very first time I ever did one of these trash audits was that there was an abundance of french fries, probably four or five pounds of french fries after one shift that were thrown in the garbage. And so that got us thinking one of two things. A, either our guests don't like our french fries, or B, we're serving too much. Either way, it's an issue. If they're throwing it away, there's a problem, and if there's a problem, we should try to address it and fix it. Hopefully, it's just that we're over-portioning it. And if that's the case, we could start portioning less and be more profitable. If they don't like the product, well then by all means we better get that fixed because we don't want people not satisfied with our product. As we evolved this exercise, we started looking at food costs and we see that our food cost is beginning to creep up in the kitchen and we can't figure out why. So we do a trash audit on the kitchen garbage cans. And what we find is that people are going well beyond the expectation when it comes to how much product they're throwing away when they were prepping vegetables. Onions being one. Lettuce, romaine, and iceberg was another one where we saw a really, really long core cut off of the romaine, too many outer wrapper leaves taken off both the romaine and the iceberg to get down to a clean, usable product. We found that it was just kind of habit. People were just peeling it without even looking at it. So one of the things that we decided to do was to take this big, it's called a Lexan container, everybody probably has a different name for it, but it's a big clear multi-quart container, it looks like a big huge bus tub. And we'd take this Lexan and we'd put it on the line and we'd move all the garbage cans. So when our guys came in to prep in the morning, all their garbage had to go in this clear container. And we explained to them why. Our waste is too high when it comes to our product, right? Our yields aren't right, so we need to get in here and really take a look at where and what we're doing wrong so that we can coach it, correct it, fix it, and move on. No one's in trouble, we just gotta figure out where the gap is in our training. And of course, just by making that comment, all of a sudden everybody's garbage was really thin, using the smallest amount of peel on onions and lettuce and uh, even tomatoes we started to see. You know, the tops would go from an inch to actually being sharked like they're supposed to instead of just sliced and throw the tops away. So we started seeing behaviors change, but it was interesting because we could also see different garbage cans or these Lexans from station to station, and we could see one guy who was maybe doing too much waste and another guy who was doing such a great job. They started to notice each other's Lexans full of garbage, and they started to kind of have this own competition. Well, I'm not going to let that guy outdo me. So it was a really interesting exercise, and of course, after the first month that we left that in place, our food cost corrected itself quickly and that was a very very cool exercise so that's a quick one relative to waste now let's talk about theft theft has oh theft has challenges it appears in a lot of different forms right and I want you to consider theft like this if you were a bank if you owned a bank and you had quarters laying out around the bank for whatever reason because you weren't organized and people started picking up those quarters. People that work for you started picking up those quarters, put them in their pocket. Would we consider that theft? We'd probably all agree, yeah, that's theft. They know who that money belongs to, and it's not theirs. So just because there's opportunity doesn't mean there should be availability. Now, 
consider that relative to this concept of grazing. And everybody understands grazing. This is when our people just pick some french fries here or there, maybe throw an extra chicken wing in the basket when they're frying the wings and they've got one left for themselves. Or maybe they overcooked a burger intentionally or otherwise, we don't know, and they started eating it uh, and they could justify it. Well, justifiable or not, it's theft and it needs to be reined in and it has to be managed. It's a critical piece of the impact on food cost. Sometimes there's even inadvertent theft, right? And theft, theft is a strong word. In other industries, they call it shrinkage, but really shrinkage means theft. So it can manifest itself in a number of different ways. We have to make sure that we have cultures where people understand our expectation. And look, if you burnt something, throw it away. If you want to eat something, cook something fresh, tell the server, ring it up. We have to be accountable to this so that we can close the gap so that people aren't, you know, accidentally making mistakes so that they can eat. Now, there's a lot of other more blatant theft, and I think we're probably all aware of what that looks like. So, I want to give you a couple of really cool tips that I had learned uh, while coming up in my restaurant career that had some great impacts on theft relative to things that went missing. So, the first one was how we managed our waste, our trash, our garbage. We did not allow garbage to just be run out by anybody at any time. And that might sound a little crazy, but there was a method to the madness. We locked the back door and it had one of the brake bars and it was on an alarm and it had to be unlocked, otherwise the alarm would go off. And while this might sound severe, it was very, very intentional. As garbage got full, our dish guys or even sometimes our, our runners or our prep guys would be responsible for checking the garbage every so often and emptying it. And they would tie it up and they would place it by the back door. Once we got a little slow, uh, somebody would have to tell the manager, hey, I need to make a trash run. The manager would go to the back door, unlock the door, go out with the employee to the outside, to the alley or into the garbage area, unlock the lock that was over the bar holding the dumpster lids from being opened at any time and help them throw the trash away, close the bin and lock it back up, go back in and lock the door. And this is so critical to managing theft because majority of all product that is stolen walks right out the back door. And if you don't believe me, trust me, we've seen it in so many different forms. We have literally seen people put steaks in the garbage, right? Wrap them up in something or put them in a box, threw the box away, and come back to retrieve it out of the garbage can after their shift. We've seen the same thing done with cases of beer, literally. Put in a big black garbage sack, tied up and thrown out, only to come back and be retrieved at night. So when the manager is there to help them take the trash out, um, it, this is also great for employee security. This ensures that nobody's going to come through the back door and do anything wrong. And we've seen those types of incidents happen before. But if people can't just go out the back door, and more importantly, if they can never come back and retrieve trash because the bin is locked, and we've really closed off one of our biggest leaks when it comes to theft. So certainly not the most exciting and mind-blowing things to learn, but they are interesting little disciplines that will help impact theft. Now, one of the other top culprits for theft seems to happen in the top 10 key items that you buy. So here's an interesting little statistic. Most restaurants, 10 items in that restaurant make up 60 to 75% of their total purchases. So what a lot of operators do is what's called a running inventory count on their top 10 items, key item inventory. And the way that this works is you would take, maybe you have your top 10 items might be a filet, a ribeye, lobster tail, shrimp, whatever it happens to be. These top 10 things, we would inventory the quantity of them that we have at the beginning of the shift. And then we would inventory how many we have at the end of the shift. Then we would go run a top 10 sales report and we'd see how many ribeyes did we start with, how many did we sell, how many do we have left over. Do those match. 
If they don't match, we can talk to the team that was touching and managing that product today instead of waiting for a week or a month to do inventory, finding this big gap on our most critical products, and then trying to ask anybody who's anybody that's been here working over the last week or month or whatever it happens to be. It's a great way to control product and it's also a great way to create awareness amongst your team that, hey, we trust you, but we have to pay attention because this is our profit, our livelihood, our ability to keep you employed. So we have a responsibility to this company and to all of us to have a job and to be responsible for how we manage this business. All right, next, spoilage. Now, spoilage is a little simpler, but it's worth reminding everybody that products should be rotated. There's a concept called FIFO, first in, first out, meaning that if everything is labeled and dated, and when new prep or new product is made and gone to put in the cooler or the different respective storage area, it's put behind the oldest product and that stuff has moved forward and that's the way that people are gonna use the product. That's really, really critical, not just from a flavor and consistency standpoint, from a food safety standpoint, and of course, from a spoilage and or waste platform. Next, I'm gonna talk about the biggest impact that is just destroying the profitability in the restaurant business, and that is portion control. So, the fastest way to manage portion control and start thinking about it consciously is to start by making sure that everybody understands what is the acceptable portion amount. Do you have a recipe book? Have people been trained to those recipes? Not only do you implement that training, but you have to inspect that training. That is critical. We would do random inspections where we'd say, hey, let's do a quick breakdown on your plate. Let's measure off those fries. Let's measure off those vegetables and see if everything added up to what it's supposed to add up to. Hey, let's take a quick, quick spot check of that steak. Let's put it on the scale and see if it is indeed 10 ounces like it's supposed to be. Now, we also made sure that we had a tool in every area on the line. Sometimes it's a spoodle, which is a combination of a spoon and a ladle. Sometimes it was a spoon, sometimes it's a disher, sometimes it is a measuring cup, but there's also going to be that sometime where it's gonna be somebody's hand. And this is one of my favorite hacks, and I'm happy to teach this to you right now. So when it comes to portion control, it would not make any sense, and trust me, we've done the analytics on this, it would not make any sense to take French fries, for example, and portion out six ounces and put them in a bag and close the bag and have all those in the freezer ready to take out and portion. And trust me, I've seen people do it. In fact, in one of my restaurants that I bought after it was already in existence, I found our employees doing it. So I did a breakdown and said, how much does the bag cost? And the bag was roughly, I think, two cents. And how much labor did we spend to break down one case? And to break down one case took my guy about a half an hour he made $10 an hour, so it's five bucks in that case. So now if I count the total number of portions that I got, I was somewhere in the neighborhood of about $2 on bags, five bucks in labor, so $7 got added to the cost of my french fries. And let's say my french fries were $23, now all of a sudden it's a $30 case of french fries. And that's to control the portion amount. So with $7, if you think about $7 relative to 23, that's about 25%. It's almost a quarter of what that total cost is to sell French fries. Everybody following me on that? Yeah? Okay. So my question was, do I have to spend that 7 bucks? What kind of margin of error could we have on our portion control and still not cost us $7? Well, what we found out was that on a six ounce serving, we could literally make a mistake and if everybody did an eight ounce serving the whole time, it would still cost us less than portioning and putting that product in a bag over and over and over again. So, how would we correct this? We still have to manage the portion control. I'm not, ex I'm not okay with allowing 15, 20% extra product to go out on the plate and saying that's an acceptable standard versus having prep and paying for bags. So we did an exercise, a muscle memory exercise, and this became a really fun thing for our guys. So we would start out by taking a plate, have some frozen french fries, and we'd put them on the plate. 
So we would start out by taking a plate and taking some cooked french fries and we would put the exact portion amount on a scale, six ounces, and then we'd put that on the plate. Everybody could see that on the plate, what it looked like. So now we'd say, okay, now you guys take six ounces out of the basket and just put it directly on the plate. And so everybody did. We had the plates lined up and they all put them on. And you should have seen the discrepancies. The differences were crazy. And this became real eye-opening to us that we had a big gap here. So after everybody had their portion amount on the plate, we scraped them off one by one into the little fry container on the scale and we weighed everybody. We wrote everybody's name down and everybody's ounces down. And for the guy or guys who were the closest to the six ounce, those guys quickly got a $1 uh, scratch lottery ticket. Now for the guys who were over, anybody who wasn't the winner had to repeat the exercise. And we kept knocking off people who got within a half an ounce variance. We would, excuse me, we would let them sit back and watch the rest of the guys and we made the other guys continue to do it. After they were all done, we made the winners come up one by one and do it again. And we started creating continuity and consistency and our guys started to actually identify which way their hand felt on those fries that was six, six ounces. Now they weren't always six ounces. But again, our threshold, our variance was less than one ounce of difference. Nobody would hardly ever do five, but we would see six, six and a half, and sometimes seven. But we'd also have to inspect this. We would have to come back every so often on the line when it's a little slow, someone's making a plate. Hey, Eddie, stop really quick. Let me see your plate. Let's just throw this on the scale real quick and see how you did. Six ounces. Boom. Here's five bucks. Nice job. Keep it up. So we try to promote and incent people for this mentality. And trust me, it was worth a couple of bucks to acknowledge people for doing it right, to create a culture of excitement around doing it right, because that started to stem into all kinds of other things. Now, we also found that this trick worked really well with cheese, a handful of cheese. We found it worked really well with salad, and salad is one of those tricky things that pretty much always has to be done by hand as well. So it started to really close the gap on our portion control beyond just the measuring tools that we used. So hopefully that muscle memory technique is something that all of you can take back and try to implore with your staff. So now we come to menu engineering and menu engineering is the makeup and the flow of your menu. And this really affects food cost. If you aren't running a sales report by item, and looking at what is trending amongst your guest, if you don't know your most popular item in every category, and you don't know your least popular item in every category, then the probability of you having some higher food cost is much more likely than somebody who is looking at that stuff. And here's why we look at it. If something is popular, it tells me that I probably have a threshold for a price increase if I need it. If something is not popular, that forces me to reevaluate the product. At a minimum, if it's not popular, look at the price. Is the item profitable? Well, if it is, but it's not popular, then there's a handful of different things that we can do. Now, I'm going to give everybody a free copy of my book which is called On the Menu, and it goes into tremendous detail on 101 different rules, tips, and techniques for menu management and menu engineering. So I'm not gonna spend a whole ton of time on that, but there are a lot of really cool things to learn about what your product tells you about your guests, their price threshold, uh, which we're gonna cover next, about your portion size, about your value proposition, all that type of stuff is really, really important. And it also goes in great detail when talking about how to make price adjustments and changes when it comes to menus uh, and how you can impact food cost without disrupting the guest perception or getting your guests upset. So that leads right to value proposition. Now again, our value proposition, I was talking about the uh, trash audit that we do where we're taking the garbage outside and we're looking to see what's in it and we noticed these fries and there was too much. Well, after studying this and even talking to some of our guests, what we found out was it's not that our fries weren't good and yeah, we might have been on the high side of the portion. What we'd actually found out was that 
we had these really thin little shoestring fries and they didn't hold heat for very long. So when they first came out, they were great, but as the guest moved on to something else and came back to the fries, they were cold and hard because they were so small and thin that people stopped eating them. So what that led us to believe was we had either come up with a better fry that holds heat better or do a smaller portion. And at a very minimum, we better make sure that that product is getting out of the window fast and to the guest so that it doesn't get cold before they want to enjoy it. Our solution was we ultimately did end up uh, moving to a different French fry. Uh, we went just a little bit thicker and it was a coated fry with a starch coating that actually kept it hotter longer. And it was a little bit bigger so we would get better volume on a plate by using the same amount of ounces and that really was a good solution for us. Now, some other value proposition pieces, and again, this is in the book relative to menu engineering. This is pretty much a whole chapter, but here's a couple of cliff notes when it comes to value proposition. First of all, if the menu is too large, the average consumer has an equation in their head, and it's very, very much buried in their subconscious, but this has been studied. And we see that a menu with more than 46 items on it, per service part, just the lunch menu, if it has more than 46 items on the menu, the guest starts to lack in confidence relative to how well you can execute all of those items. If your menu is so big, the guest believes that you can't do it all well, and so by virtue of that, if you can't do it well, you better do it cheap. So that's a value proposition. There's a lot of other value propositions on the menu too. Are the menus clean? Is the restaurant clean? All of these things can impact what they think the product is worth. How does the plate aesthetic look? Do you serve a really, really nice steak and french fries for dinner or mashed potatoes, but they get a little plastic ramekin of gravy? That little plastic ramekin of gravy makes them think, oh, this big, beautiful plate is cheapened by that. They better not be charging me too much because now it looks more like to-go food than it does formal food. So there's a handful of different things relative to the aesthetic, even down to the way that you romance the menu and describe the words. You can either go big on description or you can be a minimalist, but somewhere in between where it's just a list of ingredients and no logic or thought put behind it, that can also diminish what consumers feel like is there in the value. So let's move on and talk about recovery. Now recovery is a relatively simple concept, but it just says that if you run out of product, this can affect your food cost. If you ran out of one of your most popular things and it happened to be one of your most profitable things, then you're selling things that are less profitable and that hurts food costs. But more importantly in the recovery concept is if you run out of product and you have to go to the grocery store or you have to go someplace else and buy it at a retail price instead of a wholesale price, that's going to impact your cost. So that one's pretty simple. Now let's talk about application. Application, how you use the product, right? We have a rule in my restaurants where everything has to have a cross application of three places. Now we do make some exclusions on long shelf life product and most of that exists in our canned and dry storage areas. But certainly when it comes to anything perishable, if we can't use it in three different applications between some type of mixed drink or cocktail uh, up to and through the entire menu selection that we have, if we can't use an item in three different places and it's perishable, we don't use it. And here's why. If we have an item that we're using in one place, the chances of us using and buying it the right way in a bulk pack, a big size, is greatly diminished. And if it's greatly diminished, that means we have to buy a smaller size. If we buy a smaller size, almost 99% of the time, we are paying a lot more for it, right? This is the concept of supply and demand. You buy a 40 pound box of bananas, it's going to be a lot less expensive than a 10 pound box of bananas. Um, and, and that goes throughout just about everything that you can think of that you purchase. So the answer is no, you don't have to stop buying bananas, just figure out a way to incorporate bananas into other things. 
Um, and bananas is just an example. It can be anything. But we have to be disciplined about our cross utilization of a product so that we can make sure we're buying it right, not wasting excess or paying too much by buying too small of an amount. All right. The last part about application is using the wrong product. And I've seen this happen a lot. And this is where it's so important and critical to consult with your distributor because distributors know this stuff so much better than we'll ever know it. I, as a career chef and a restaurant owner for years, there was so much stuff I didn't know until I actually started consulting with food service distribution and working with clients and the sales team in these distribution companies, they started to show me things I didn't even know existed. Eight, nine, ten different products that could accomplish the same thing that I was doing, and I just had some bad logic applied to how I learned how to buy product and then use it and sell it. So an example, a really simple example, was we would buy fresh mushrooms, beautiful fresh mushrooms, and they all got chopped. And we didn't use whole mushrooms for anything. And then I find out from the vendor, well, hey, you can buy these sliced mushrooms. They cost a dollar more a case, but that's cheaper than the labor you'd put into them. And the price is reduced because all the big, beautiful, shiny ones that went into this box, any ones with little scuffs or scrapes or bruising, that's what goes into the chopping process. And you don't notice, by the way, because they're all going to be rendered and cooked. And that's why the product is almost equal to the price of the other. Now, even if it was a little more expensive, it doesn't matter. But this was something that I saw and I said, oh, my gosh, this is a game changer. Another thing, for years, we were using a sized chicken breast, a six ounce chicken breast, because that's what I'd always seen, but we take this six ounce chicken breast and we would chop it for our salads. And we would also use it for a sandwich. And so uh, we were being consulted with on some product and the guy says, hey, you know you can buy these random chicken breasts. Now mind you, that's popular now. 20 years ago, I had never heard of random chicken breast. And somebody puts it in front of me and says, hey, if it doesn't have to be six ounces, you can save a ton of money buying this random chicken breast and you can get your breasts out of it and everything that's too big or oversized or that you can't portion down to six ounces, cook that off and use that for your salads. And I thought, yeah, that's pretty much a no-brainer. At almost half the price, I promise you it was a no-brainer. So there's all kinds of application pieces. And to get the most out of your distribution company, instead of beating them up over the price of this or the price of that or where you can get this or why you can't get that or why your truck is late, spend some time sitting down with your rep or the faculties available to you through the company and say, hey, why don't you guys sit down with me and look at how I use my product and see if we can come up with any solutions. I have never encouraged somebody to do that and heard back that there was any negative consequence. In fact, every single time I've asked somebody to do that and they've done it, they have found an incredible insight relative to an application of product that they didn't know about that was able to save them more money and in turn end up making them more profit. So the very last thing that I'm going to talk about is yield. And again, yield is one of those things that requires some consistency. And this is really important when it comes to recipes. If you're going to figure out the cost of a recipe, you can't just take the cost of a recipe, divide the whole case of product dollars by pounds and figure out how much per ounce cost if the product has to be further cleaned or processed. Take that romaine. On average, romaine yields about 70%. So if you pay $10 for it, for 10 pounds, let's say, 10 bucks, 10 pounds, you are actually paying $10 for seven pounds. That makes the per ounce price quite a bit different. And so you really want to be conscious of that when you're building your recipes and costing out your recipes to see if they're viable. Now, one of the other interesting pieces relative to that conversation is the market value of the product. When you do a yield study on something, you should be thinking of, will that yield change throughout the year? Is there any reason why that yield would change? And I can tell you when it comes to produce, the answer is yes. We see the yield in the spring and summertime on romaine somewhere between 20 and 30 percent, whereas in the wintertime when there's less availability, worse conditions, higher what we call white core or white heart where that white crown at the bottom, the white goes almost all the way halfway up to the heart of the romaine and then you guys chop it to get rid of it because they don't want all that white meat in the mix of romaine. 
at times in the winter and fall season. So it's really, really critical to know if these yields are going to change, how are they going to affect my product? Now, the good news is most of the yields that change are right in line with our appetite. When the yields remain change, people are hopefully eating less salad that time of the year and looking for heartier, heavier meals. But, you know, in warm climate areas, that looks a little bit different. So there's some challenges. Anyway, that wraps up yield and that pretty much wraps up the conversation. I will be available in the back of the room today for anybody who has any further questions, if you want me to explain something in a little bit more detail. And of course, if anybody would like to sign up for a copy of this presentation that I went through to get all the details, all the information that we shared, you can have it for free. There's no strings attached. Just sign up with your email so we know who to send it to and we will send it to you post haste so that you can continue to review this. And if you found some important insights about this, feel free to dive in and have some of these conversations with your team to build support and to get everybody rallied around this concept. I promise you, if you start focusing on these nine things we just talked about, you will be on your way to the beginning of impacting this food cost formula and move towards generating more profit in your restaurants. So thanks a lot for joining. I really appreciate it. Stay tuned if you want. The next session is going to be the more advanced food cost formula and equation, how to really take it to the next level. So I hope you found value in this. Please join us for the next one, and we'll talk to you guys soon.